for being here, folks. Uh, my name is Mac Callahan, and I work for the U.S. Forest Service Southern Research Station, and I'm stationed in Athens, Georgia. Um, I was telling Angie, my colleague here, who is also a Forest Service employee, and we'll talk to you a little bit later about some more regulatory things. Um, that the last time I was in this room was when my sister was being married uh, wow. to her husband about 20 years ago. They had the whole thing opened up and uh, was wearing a monkey suit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is a this is a trip home for me. I guess is what I'm trying to say. I grew up in Dahlonega. And my dad was a biology teacher at uh, a biology professor at North Georgia College for about 35 years. And so these are my stomping grounds, as you would say in Georgia. Um, I would skip school and come hike the waterfall uh, on a routine basis and access Springer Mountain from up here as well. So um, that's just by way of introduction to tell you that I grew up doing uh, field work with my dad from the time I was able to, to walk, really. I had a backpack with water bottles in it for collecting water samples. He was a limnologist. And so um, I hope I can convince you that I have a dog in the hunt with regard to the management, the responsible management of these lands. This is my home, um, and this is where I came from. But I have worked my way up from being a biological science technician in the Apalachicola National Forest uh, when I was still an undergraduate, I worked there in the summertime. Um, and have, you know, gone through graduate school, and now I'm a research scientist with the station. And uh, it's a great job if you can, you can take the, the climate sometimes. So I was asked to um, give this presentation about changing forests, and I think um, we borrowed heavily from some, some stuff that we put together in collaboration with Angie and the folks in the supervisor's office for the Chattahoochee Pony to try to kind of bring in the historical perspective of where these lands came from, how, how they were assembled, and how they came to be held in public trust, and, um, and from there spring into some of the modern day challenges that we face with regard to, to responsible management of these lands, and hopefully give you all a little bit of a better feel of the, the sort of climate that we as Forest Service employees have to operate under. Um, and with the, ultimate goal, I hope, of opening a dialogue with everybody who's interested in, in these lands, which belong to you, uh, the, the American public. Okay, so uh, the way we start this, this discussion, I think, needs to go back to before we were the United States of America. This is um, thinking about the period of time from when colonization really started to pick up, say 1750, until 1850. That 100 year period was instrumental in the development of our the identity as Americans in the first place and our relationship with the land that we were coming to um, make use of. Some people would call conquer uh, the, con the continent of North America. So this, we think that this painting, which is from Thomas Cole from the 1830s, sort of captures what the ethic of the average American was at that time. And so in the painting, it's as many of those paintings of that time period were as deeply allegorical painting, right? So what you see on this side is the untamed and untrammeled forest, and it's kind of a dark and foreboding and scary looking place. You've got a gnarled tree and dark clouds and rain falling. <laughs> Um, and so this is, this is how people viewed the forest. It was a primeval, dangerous, dark, scary place. And then if you look over here on the other side, not a stick of timber, right? Everything's been cleared. You got wheat sheaves or wheat shocks being piled into sheaves there. Um, you know, everything is kind of cleared off, pasture land, tame, right? And you'll notice that the sun is shining and there's a beautiful vista on that side. And so this, is the, this was the social context that, that people were operating within. And uh, you know, you're, you're unconsciously biased by the time in which you live. So we're trying to just kind of set the stage as to what people, how people felt about forests at the time. So during this period of time, 1750 to 1850, it was firmly held as a belief that the resources of the continent would never, ever be exhausted. They believed that. There was so much wilderness that there was no way we could ever reach the end of it, right? Um, and so what, you happen, what happens uh, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution is that tools like this steam crane or the steam skitter or whatever, and these steam drawn cranes made it possible for them to um, 
really ramp up the extraction process, right? And so it wasn't too long before we went from believing that it was a never-ending plenty to having major portions of the landscape looking like this, right? So this photograph is from the Pisgah National, what is now the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina, okay? And so this attitude of never-ending plenty kind of went on went with regard to animal resources too. These are, this is a bale of, uh, artist depiction of a bale of passenger pigeons right, which they sold at market. There's some live passenger pigeons, maybe some of the last ones, right? And this pile here is a pile of buffalo skull, buffalo skulls. So that was kind of the rate of extraction and the, and the attitude, the ethic that we had at the time. As a, as a society, I put this one in too because this is from closer to home. So this is a Piedmont scene in Georgia and the extraction of, uh, Cotton, the extractive nature of cotton agriculture basically resulted in a lot of land that looked like that where you couldn't grow even a blade of grass. It was so heavily eroded. Um, okay, so I hope this is uh, setting the stage for you uh, with regard to kind of what the what the land looked like, say around 1850. We're here. I also have to say that this is the first time I've ever given a presentation to a yellow lab horse. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> yeah, he's soaking it in. All right, so this is kind of where we are. So a, a major watershed event in the development of a change in land ethic in the United States happened with this fire in Wisconsin in Peshtigo in 1871. So what had happened is that a big swath of the state of Wisconsin had been logged. All the natural resources or the, the timber resources extracted and was left with a bunch of slash and kind of um, messy conditions. And they had a dry summer and it all caught fire. And 2,500 people were killed in this event. And it made national news as any kind of event like that would, right? So we're, we're hearing about Sonoma County right now. This is the Sonoma County equivalent, except it burned an area probably 10 times that size and maybe 10 times the number of people perished. And so people started to say, well, now are we doing the right thing if what we're doing with this logging, this untrammeled logging, um, is this the right thing to do with regard to what gets left behind and the, and the kind of conditions that people have to deal with? So we think. Um, I should say now that my colleague Joe O'Brien contributed uh, substantially to this, to the presentation here. He and I worked together on this uh, to try to refine it over the last year or so. But we think that this was the actual beginnings. If you go back to the newspaper clippings, this is where you start to hear people talk about slowing things down, being a little bit more um, deliberate in the way we make decisions about where we harvest and how we harvest and what we leave behind. Okay, so further, so now we're in the germ, the, the germplasm days of conservation and the, and the conservation ethic. So these two gentlemen are obviously very critical figures in, this, in the development of this whole idea as well. So here's Teddy Roosevelt, and that's Gifford Pinchot, who was the chief, the first chief of the Forest Service. And I'll just read this out to you. So Roosevelt said, of all the questions which can come before this nation short of the actual preservation of its existence in a great war, there is none which compares in importance with the great central task of leaving this land even a better land for our descendants than it is for us. And that's a fairly cogent and concise statement of what the conservation yeah. ethic came to mean uh, through his good works with the national parks and formation of the national forests. So this is our man. Forest four Service people in this room know who he is. We, we know a lot about him. He was our first chief. And one of his famous quotes is that where conflicting interests must be reconciled, the question will always be decided from the standpoint of the greatest good of the greatest number in the long run. Now that's all nearly socialist, right, in its, in its leanings. But I think that um, those are words that people need to be hearing these days. Right, so the greatest good has sort of become the unofficial motto of the Forest Service. 
Okay, so fire has been a really important part in the development of national forests and our, our management approach, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but this sort of, sort of started building momentum in the 1910s and 1911 when the big fires out west burned. Um, this is, again, storied history for people who are in the Forest Service. I don't know if y'all know about these or not, but big fires in uh, Montana. They're depicted in cinema in the uh, that movie, A River Runs Through It. Um, and this guy who you can't see, I don't know why my um, animation isn't working. This picture is supposed to come up. The guy who's pointing that way is a famous figure, Ed Pulaski, who was one of the folks who was out there fighting those fires and he even has a, a tool that all fire crews carry named after him. Okay, so that's all backdrop. So we've got um, massive uh, extraction operations for timber going on in the east and in the west. It's resulting in fires. It's resulting in degradation of land, and it's resulting in a lot of a lot of uh, places that look kind of like this, right? And people are starting to get a little bit concerned about whether or not that's ethically the right thing to do. And so. What happened was that the honorable gentleman from Massachusetts, Weeks, um, wrote legislation to try to authorize the purchase of lands for the public trust, to be held in public trust east of the Mississippi. Prior to that time, there had been a constitutional debate as to whether or not it was um, permissible for, the, for Congress to authorize the purchase of lands. Right, so we got all this land through through the Louisiana Purchase, and that's what made the Western National Forest a possibility. But in the East, everything was held privately. Okay, and so there was a so just again to help us all feel better about the climate that we currently live in. Right, these things have always been contentious since the beginning of the country. Right, so this is back in the early teens, early teens. So this constitutional debate was resolved through. Uh, Mr. Weeks's brilliant stroke of, of genius, which was that this kind of degradation on the land results in and this kind of extractive stuff too, which was done over in Dahlonega. This is a plaster mining operation where they blast away a whole of hillsides. All of this sediment that is being produced in these kinds of operations and through erosion when you clear cut place, all that sediment winds up in the rivers, right? And if you have rivers getting clogged up, there's no way to conduct interstate commerce on those rivers. And so it was through the Commerce Clause in the Constitution that they were allowed, that, that they were able to convince the rest of the Congress that it would be an okay thing to purchase lands in order to protect them and halt the process of erosion and the silting in of rivers. All right, so a little bit of a backdoor approach, but it worked. And that's how the Chattahoochee National Forest got purchased was through the provisions of the Weeks Act. So they were, it, it authorized the purchase of land from willing sellers for the protection and the conservation of forests. The Oconee National Forest, which is the other unit, the Piedmont unit of the Ch Chattahoochee Oconee, was uh, authorized through a different, uh, a different congressional act called the Clark McNary Act which was just an expansion of federal authority to purchase lands and essentially it was the same deal these worn out lands from the Piedmont cotton growing days um, that nobody wanted, that people were more than happy to sell. Uh, you hear the you hear the um, the myth nowadays that the government came and took our land, but they didn't take any land from anybody. They bought it only from willing sellers, um, and these were people who were by and large in tax default already. So um, that's kind of the story there, and I, I put the the statue of this uh, Grecian figure holding up a model of the boll weevil. That's in uh, Enterprise, Alabama, the monument to the boll weevil. And they put, that, they put that monument there to celebrate the boll weevil because it opened up uh, a, a wider uh, diversity of agricultural pursuits for that area. And so they got rid of cotton and they found out that they could do other things. And so they made a monument to the boll weevil since it helped usher cotton out. Okay, any questions or anything? I feel like I've been rambling for a while here. Yeah, yeah back. Good, good. Okay, so good. Clarification, yeah. so the Clark McNary Act affected the West? No, no, like, this, this, is, this so, is still in the East. So 
there has been precious little land purchase ever happened in the West after the Louisiana purchase, basically, right? So all of that was held in public trust anyway, and just big chunks of it got preserved as federal holding. So but prior to that, everything east of the Mississippi was held in private, uh, in private, by private means, and so we had to assemble all of the national forests that we have in the east today through the provisions of these two acts. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so that's the history of, of public land, federal forest service land anyway, in the east. And so now we're gonna move into some of the things that are, that today's forest service has to deal with in light of issues like uh, global change and um, societal change and so forth. So within the Forest Service today, we have about 193 million acres of national forests and grassland, so it's a pretty good chunk of the land. Most of it still out west, but there's about six million acres east of the Mississippi that are Forest Service lands. Um, so we work with state and local agents to assist the stewardship of about 50 million, uh, 500 million acres of non-federal land uh, in rural and urban forests. So that's with that state and private forestry wing I was telling you about before. And the Forest Service is the largest natural resource research organization in the world. That's the research wing that I was telling you about earlier. So um, although we're shrinking every year, we still are the largest one in the world. We're proud of that. Um, and we work with partners all over the world uh, to protect global forest resources too. So in my career, that's meant I've been able to, have been really privileged to travel to Brazil and China and do advice and counsel um, with people who are trying to restore forests in those countries as well. And we can talk about that more if you want to uh, later. But it's not an easy job, and Angie's gonna talk to you about that at, uh, at some length later on, but this is just a laundry list of all the federal statutes that govern the activities of the United States Forest Service. And uh, there'll be a test later, so it's <laughs> memory. Um, there are only 24? Well, this is a sample, right? <laughs> yeah, so those are the big ones. Um, it, it, it's, uh, as I say, from a regulatory standpoint, it's not an easy job. It's just straight up. We have to do what the Congress dictates, and we serve at the pleasure of the President, because we're executive, we're part of the executive branch, and uh,